So in the previous class, we have you know understood the registration part. I mean to say the person who is liable for registration, that part we have covered. Okay, let's recap what was that. A person who is liable for registration is one who exceeds the threshold limit. That is the aggregate turnover threshold limit. This is how uh, you know, the chart was. You know, states with threshold limit of rupees 10 lakhs for your supplier of goods and services which covers Manipur, Mizoram, Nagaland and Tripura. Okay, the states with threshold limit of rupees 20 lakhs for the supplier of goods or your services, it covers your Arunachal Pradesh, Meghalaya, Sikkim, Uttarakhand, Puducherry, and Telangana. For the states with the threshold limit of rupees 20 lakhs for the supplier of your services only, okay, and then both goods and services is of rupees 20 lakhs and threshold limit which is of rupees 40 lakhs for your supplier of goods basically your interest it supplies it comes to 40 lakhs which covers your Jammu and Kashmir which covers your Assam, Himachal Pradesh and all other states. This was a discussion regarding the aggregate turnover threshold limit diagram. Now, if we talk about the uh, no calculation of your aggregate turnover, the calculation part is forward. We have, you know, calculated this yesterday. I mean, uh, the in the previous class. So, how do you calculate it? It's basically you are you are supposed to sum up your taxable supplies. Exam supplies, exports, interest rate supplies, and aggregate turnover. Summing, uh, I mean, summing up uh, one, two, three, four, you will get your aggregate turnover. And it is basically all India basis, same plan. It is computed same in every state. So you need to remember what is supposed to be excluded that is your CGST, SGST, UTGST, IGST compensation says and value of your value of your inward supplies on which the tax is payable under your reverse charge mechanism now let's move on further basically you know covering up the registration nature it is your pan based and state specific <clears throat> it is pan based and state specific one registration per state or union territory in case if it you know if it happens that you know the businesses are segregated to a number of places separate places then the particular state may obtain the separate registration for each of your places of the businesses. And there is nothing like, you know, CGST, you have the separate registration or SGST, you will have separate registration. Only the single registration is going to serve all of the supply taxable, I mean, taxable supplies. That is your CGST, SGST, UTGST, IGST, and the CESS. Now, coming to the GSTIN number. Okay, what is GSTIN number? GSTIN number is basically your identification number. You know, uh, uh, you know, it's like a roll number which is allotted to you. So, what it serves, it serves a 15-digit number, okay. It's a certificate registration which is there with your GSTIN which is made available and it is found on your GSTN common portal.
Now, how is it 15 digits? So, here is the format. So, the first two letters, as I said, it is your 15 digits number. Okay. So, first two numbers is basically your state code of India. The two digit part. The another, uh, you know, 10 uh, digit uh, numbers, I mean the alphanumerical part is basically your PAN number of the person or the manufacturer or the trader or the exporter or you can call it as a dealer. Then the 13th number is basically your entity number of the same PAN holder in the state. One, I mean the next 14th is basically the default letter that is Z. And last is basically the checksum digit, which is again the one number. I mean one digit number. So it sum up amount to 15 digits. And now learning for your UIN, that is your unique identification number. It's basically a registration number, again, which is given to the specific persons only instead of your GSTIN. Basically, this person will not be served or maybe it will be served both. That is your GSTIN and also your UIN. Basically, what is the main purpose? Now, since, you know, GSTIN was regarding you need to have the registration and to identify that particular per entity, person or the organization, this numbers helps us to identify. Now, what is the purpose of your UIN then? So, this allows your body to receive the tax refund on the inward supplies of your goods and services. Basically, your purchases, that is your ITC, the refund part is available with UIN even on your reverse charge mechanism. Now, basically, who are those persons who can opt for UIN? So, who can apply basically is the uh, question. <clears throat> so, any specified agency under your UN, okay, that is your United Nation Organization or multilateral financial institution and organization which is again notified under your Union, uh, United Nations Privileges and Immunities Act of 1947. Like for example, WHO, IMF, UNCENO, etc. So, again, the next member can be a consulator or the assembly of your foreign countries or any other person who is notified by the commission. Now, again, a hint part is there. That is, you know, this particular persons or maybe called as the organizers will not be liable under your current GST regime in Indian territory. Hence, uh, you can say that any taxes may be your direct or the indirect which is collected from such persons or the organizations are refunded back to them and hence UIN is basically regarding the refund basically regarding the refund of your inward supplies Our GST registration procedure, we will discuss it later. But what is the procedure for the UIN registration? Okay, so for this, anyone again who is the person associated can apply. For UN through your GST registration form number 13. Again, 
if the proper officer is satisfied, he is going to assign the UIN and he will issue a certificate for the form of GST registration number 06 within three working days from the date of the submission of application. So the effective date over here is the submission. If you are doing the submission, from that you need to consider three days and your UIN will be registered only if your proper officer is satisfied through it. And which form you are supposed to use it? It is your form number 13 and you will get a reward back in the form of the certificate 06. Now, in this case, now you have understood the registration of your UIN. Now, how to file your returns? Returns means basically if you want that refund, you need to first file it. Okay, so how you can file? So, here you must file the return under uh, your GSTR 11 by 20th of the next month in order to claim your refunds of your inward supplies and what exactly details they are asking for they are asking for your supplies of your taxable goods and your services further your UN holder will not be allowed to add or modify any of your details under your GSTI 11. The information is auto-populated information from the seller's point of view under the GSTR 1, that is the sales part. So, here no modifications are there. The return must be filed again within six months from the last day of the quarter in which your supplies was received. Let's consider one thing. Like, what if your seller is a registered with GST but still supplying to UIN candidate? then how could be your transactions? So, it should be mentioned uh, in UIN that you are, uh, you know, in that particular invoices regarding the GST and the UIN part. And one should treat the sales as supplies to the other, another registered person considering business to business transactions. And of course, your invoices regarding the same must be uploaded in the same manner as normal sales, that is your business to business sales. Now, again, uh, coming to the UIN digits. So, the first two digits is regarding <clears throat> it's of your 18 digits. <clears throat> it's of 18 digits which comprises of first two digits is for your state code. The another 10 digits is of your PAN number. Another one digit is regarding the number of your PAN state holder. Next is again the default number. And the another one is for the checksum digits. Now, what is exactly the difference between your UIN and your GSTIN? So, if you see the comparison part, apart from the count of the numbers, the difference over here you can identify is that both are having the different identification numbers under your GST. Here, 
the GST and number is allocated with any of your regular taxpayer under your GST to carry out his or her tax obligations. But if we talk about UIN, it is issued to the specific bodies of the person which we have discussed. Which are those persons? <clears throat> Let's recap. We have the specialized agency of UN organizations, the consolidated or the embassy of the foreign countries or any other person which has been notified by the commissioner. Coming to the registration part, the person who is liable for registration we have covered. Now covering with the person who is not liable for the registration so one is any person who is engaged exclusively on your supplying of goods or services or both will not be liable to tax or which is wholly exempt from the tax. Like for example, if he is selling the alcoholic products, okay, which is for the human consumption. So that won't be covering your uh, uh, GST. In case if someone is selling the land, again, not covered. Next is the agriculturist limit to the supply of produce out of the cultivation land that means any agricultural land is again a not i mean not a part for the registration <clears throat> anyone who is making the reverse charge supplies is also not covered under your registration if any person uh, you know making interstate supplies of the taxable services maximum limit is 20 lakhs okay person making interstate supplies which is for the notified handicraft goods up to rupees 20 lakhs and next is the casual taxable person who is making your interstate taxable supplies of notified handicraft goods which is again for the 20 lakhs. Now, this in this particular section, if this 20, 20 lakhs is valid or it might change, the threshold limit might change for these states of Mizoram, Tripura and Manipur uh, and Nagaland also, which amounts to rupees 10 lakhs. For other rest of these states, it is 20 lakhs only. Okay. Uh, before you know, come you know, uh, you know, before we proceed forward, uh, I just skipped uh, one part, I guess. Uh, so here, if you have seen, you know, that the entity is getting the same plan holder, or I mean to say, the state code of India, I mean, sorry, sorry, state code of India, the two digit numeric number. I will just share you the screen. I mean the uh, PDF which contains the list of the state codes. So if you could see it's uh, it's basically arranged according to the alphabetical order. Okay, so Andaman, Nicobar, uh, the serial number is there, straight number is there, the TN number of the first two digits and the state code is there. Okay, so if we talk first is Andaman, Nicobar Islands, which is 35 and the initials are AN, Andhra Pradesh 28, that is AP, Andhra Pradesh new one is 37 AD. Uh, Arunachal Pradesh 12 AR, Assam 18 AS, Bihar 10 BH, 
चंडीगढ़ फोर सी एच दरदा एंड नगर हवेली ट्वेंटी सिक्स डी एन दामन एंड डीयू ट्वेंटी फाइव डी डी दिल्ली सेवन डी एल गोवा थर्टी जी ए गुजरात ट्वेंटी फोर जी जे हरियाणा सिक्स जीरो सिक्स एच आर हिमाचल प्रदेश जीरो टू एच पी जम्मू एंड कश्मीर जीरो वन जे के झारखंड ट्वेंटी जे एच कर्नाटका ट्वेंटी नाइन के ए केरला थर्टी टू के एल लक्षद्वीप आइलैंड्स थर्टी वन एल डी मध्य प्रदेश ट्वेंटी थ्री एम पी महाराष्ट्र ट्वेंटी सेवन एम एच मणिपुर फोर्टीन एम एन मेघालय सेवनटीन एम ई मिजोरियम फिफ्टीन एम आई नागालैंड थर्टीन एन एल उड़ीसा ट्वेंटी वन ओ आर पुडुचेरी थर्टी फोर पी वाई पंजाब जीरो थ्री पी वी राजस्थान जीरो एट आर जे सिक्किम इलेवन एस के तमिलनाडु थर्टी थ्री टी एन तेलंगाना थर्टी सिक्स टी एस त्रिपुरा सिक्सटीन टी आर उत्तर प्रदेश जीरो नाइन यू पी उत्तराखंड जीरो फाइव यू टी वेस्ट बेंगाल नाइनटीन डब्ल्यू बी सो दिस वे दी यू नो स्टेट कोर्ट विच इज मैं ओके सो दिस वॉज रिगार्डिंग दी जीएसटी एंड स्टेट कोड ऑफ इंडिया समन इज ट्राइंग टू स्पीक चंद्रकांत okay now the next part is regarding the compulsory registration in certain cases okay so by default they are supposed to register themselves under the uh, registration one is the interstate supplier anyone who is making the interstate supply transactions they have to go for the uh, registration that is from mumbai to delhi if someone is supplying then one has to compulsorily register second is casual taxable person since they are uh, they don't have any fixed place of business so they are moving here and there and coming for the businesses so they are supposed to register it compulsory even the non resident taxable person goes with the same they are supposed to uh, register compulsory even if someone is making some supplies regarding your reverse charge basis so this persons are compulsory liable for registration those who are operating the e commerce are supposed to register themselves or the person who is supplying through your e-commerce operator like for example amazon flipkart they are supposed to register every e-commerce operator who is required to collect your tax at source are supposed to like you know 
liable to register every person who is going to serve online information and your databases access or any retrieval services from a place who is associated outside india to a person in india other than your registered person is also liable for the registration like from london someone is providing the services online regarding let's say counseling part he is liable for the registration under your gst because he is rendering his services next is the persons who are required to deduct tax under section 51 next your input service distributor whether or not who is separately registered under this act next the persons or the class of person who is notified by the central state government this persons are supposed to compulsorily liable for the registration you don't need to calculate the aggregate turnover and check the threshold limit for it if you see any kind of Uh, I I mean any of the supplies which is mentioned over here, you should realize that you know they come under your compulsory registration part. And again, the section over here is two twenty four. I mean twenty four. Now. since we have understood how you know basically the person who is liable for your registration person who is not liable for registration and the compulsory registration in part one needs to understand the deemed registration part deemed yani ki it is understood like deem matlab it is understood ki okay ab hamara registration is done karke okay so how when this is going to happen if there is a grant of your registration or you or uin under any of the act that is your sgst act or the utgst act is deemed to be registered under your cgst act again you need to take a note that your application for your registration has not been rejected okay if there is a rejection under your sgst or utgst act then your cgst wala will be held cancelled and again the vice versa case okay if the rejection of the application for your registration of your uin sgst utgst act is deemed to be rejection of the application of your registration under your cgst act there are only two cases either it is rejected or not if it is rejected then it is understood ki your cgst is also rejected and if it is approved then it is approved for your cgst also a simple chart to understand your deemed registration cgst i mean sgst utgst either it may be rejected or approved it is same applicable to your cgst act also this was your deemed registration now moving on further with the uh okay i just i guess the slides are not visible now one second 
sharing the slide. Mm -hmm. Now understanding where and when one must apply for your registration. Okay. So again, who is a normal person? Basically a person who is liable for your registration under 22 or under section 24. So in each state, he is also liable. I mean the registration is basically liable for everything and within 30 days from the date on which he becomes liable he is supposed to register himself in case of your casual taxable person or your non-resident taxable person so again here also he is liable under for for every state or uh, the union territory but he need to uh, understand that he has to at least inform five days prior to the commencement of business. Ye, in this case, they are supposed to inform prior because these are the person who have no fixed place of business. Someone is coming from outside and doing the business. So they need to inform it earlier. And here in this case, I mean the first part I mean the difference between two I will explain the first part is where one is someone is understood ki okay now you are liable for the registration then before 30 days he is supposed to apply for your registration like for example the threshold limit has exceed it is something rupees 41 lakhs for the date let's say Take us uh, take today's date only, twenty fifth uh, September, uh, two thousand twenty three. He is liable for the registration. Now within thirty days, he is supposed to, uh, register himself. Now if we ta calculate, you would understand that next date comes is, uh, twenty fifth October. Now. Now, this was 30 days ka part. Let's say, for example, if the date was something. thirty, Okay. 30 July 23. Then what would have been the uh, date? 29th July 23. Uh, I mean. 28 uh, sorry 29 august 23 why because uh, in july 31 days are there so you need to look uh, for the number of days which is basically lying and accordingly calculate it to uh, make it sure key when uh, according when the person will be liable for the registration and uske under hi aapko registration karna hai. Now, what is basically your effective date of registration? The effective date is basically on the date where one has to to register it by default as I know we have discussed now also ki ye 30 days mein one has to register in this case if the applicant uh, you know is submitting that registration form there are two chances he can submit it within 30 days or he can submit it after 30 days then what would be the effective date so here your effective date says that on which he becomes liable for your registration is the 30 days part. And of grant of registration is also an effective date for after 30 days wala case mein. Only if the uh, proper officer allows, only then the uh, date of registration will be the grant of registration given by the proper officer. 
so you have to read it like this application submitted by the applicant becoming liable to the registration within 30 days then the effective uh, date will be on which he becomes liable for the registration application submitted by the applicant becoming liable to registration after 30 days the effective date is of grant of your registration you need to learn this okay now coming to the procedure part okay coming to the procedure for your registration just a minute sharing you the screen i mean the page okay Okay, so the procedure for your registration, the first part is basically you are supposed to fill that form which is available for your GST registration 01. Okay, now who is going to do this? Every person who is liable to get registered, they are supposed to come seek for the voluntary registration or maybe compulsory registration. So before applying, he need to declare his PAN number the mobile number, your email address, and the state UT in your registration form 01. Now, in this case, the PAN number, mobile number, and email address are going to get validated. And the PAN validation is basically done by the common portal from the CBDT databases. And the mobile number is basically verified by uh, using through one time password. Okay, so normally uh, we do get it. So the first step is basically filling out the form regarding the details which is there under the registration 01 that is PAN mobile email address and the state UTID where your PAN is going to get validated from your CBDT databases and your mobile number is going to get validated by you know sending you the one-time password next Step 2. Now, since you have applied, you will just temporarily get a number. Okay. After, uh, you know, getting after the application part. That is called as your. <coughs> that is called as your temporary reference number. Okay. Now, why this is, you know, given to it? to communicate with the applicant when the validation of your mobile number and email address is done. Step 3. Using this particular temporary reference number, one can submit the application form which is available in part B of your application form. Again, there are some specific documents 
at the common portal. You know, basically what kind of details are there? It is regarding the constitution of your business or any jurisdiction or any composition part, option for the composition, the date of commencement of your business, reason to obtain that registration, the address of PPOB and the nature of activity which is carried out with them or details of APOB. The details of your bank account. PPOB is basically your principal place of business. Details of authorized signatory, Aadhaar card authentication. APOB is basically your additional place of business <coughs> just a bit <coughs> <coughs> Extremely sorry, just give me a minute. Okay, uh, sorry, uh, for keep you waiting. Okay, so again, recapping, uh, the first step was to file your return. I mean, uh, we are discussing. Okay, uh, the first step is basically to apply for the registration under zero one. You will be required to serve the information regarding your PAN details, mobile number, email address. And this is going to get validated accordingly. The second step is that after applying, you know, a reference number is generated. That is called as your temporary reference number. Using that uh, reference number, we can fill out the form uh, which is available uh, in the next step that is in the part B you know by you know we are supposed to submit the specific documents what details covers your part B application it consists of your constitution of your businesses any jurisdiction composition part nature of activity which is carried out the principal place of business, the additional place of business, the account details, the authorized signatures, etc. Next.
is on receipt of such application. On receipt of such applications, uh, an acknowledgement has been prescribed, which is issued electronically. Here, the casual taxable person who is applied. For the registration gets the temporary registration number who can make the advance payment or the advance deposit in his electronic cash ledger and acknowledge it only if it is said deposited. And after this, this application is again been evaluated, I mean checked by the proper officer and after the procedure of the receipt of the application which is done by the uh, proper uh, officer is uh, accepted okay now what exactly this proper officer is going to examine about you know once he get the application forms like you know once you are writing down the examinations we are the person who checks it correct similarly here, the proper officer checks out the uh, applications, examines the application, the documents which has been submitted by the organization. <coughs> organization. So, let's say if the same are found in order, if we think in the positive term, okay he tell every information which is filled is it true and fair now we can move forward so uh, within seven working days from near the date of submission without site verification if the applicant sub successfully validates his other authentication in case where your applicant fails to undergo all of this uh, opt for the aadhaar card or authentication or your proper proper officer deems it to fit to carry out the site verification registration is granted within 30 days of application after the site verification and the prescribed documents what if what if it is not okay if the proper, I mean, the documents or uh, the examination part, he, the proper officer notices something fishy electronically. So, within seven working days, again, the informations or the documents of the applications are again verified, but the notices may be issued not later than 30 days from the application date in case the In case the person over here basically fails to undergo with the Aadhaar authentication or does not opt for the Aadhaar authentication or the proper officer deems it fit to carry out the site verification. So when the information is served wrong, then what is supposed to be done? If the applicant has furnished the clarification or the information or the documents which is required by the proper officer within the seven working days from the receipt of your notice, then, then what? Or if, if he fails, then what? Let's consider if he, you know, satisfied it, okay? That is within seven working days from the receipt of if he satisfied okay so within seven working days from the receipt of their payment regarding the information clarification and the documents the proper officer will grant the registration certificate form of your gst that is the gst registration 06 okay what if he is not furnishing it okay then your he may reject it even 
after you know giving him the reminders regarding it or he can directly you know do it under the first step also okay and he will of course mention the reasons as to why uh, one is not serving it i mean why he is cancelling it okay so the reason he is he will be specifying because he need to give the clarification regarding the uh, rejection so the clarification which was basically said is the modification or the correction of your particulars which is declared in the application for the registration order uh, other than pan state mobile number and the email address because that was under the first part only next one needs to understand ki just in case that po fails okay to inform you okay then it is to be understood ki uh, after 30 days you know if there is nothing uh, uh, which is said or doubted for the, the registration uh, process then it is to be understood ki okay your registration has been done so within 30 days from the date of submission of the application in case where the registration is to be granted after physical verification of the premises of a person who fails to undergo the Aadhaar authentication or does not opt for the same or where your PO deems it fit to carry out the site verification or within seven working days from your date of submission of the application in the case other than above or within seven working days from your date of receipt of clarification information or the documents which is furnished by the applicant so in all of these cases one need to understand it has been i mean the grant for your application has been done that is you are been registered for the gst till your anyone is uh, carrying any doubt in the further lecture uh, we will cover with these provisions which is there for your casual taxable person and the non-resident taxable person you know for them also how much registration is done when is to be done that procedure we will cover we will cover the changes which is there i mean the amendment of your registration if any the cancellation and revocation part of your registration or if someone wants to cancel the registration then what exactly your procedure one has to follow and if someone want to uh, cancel the cancellation part, that is the revocation of your cancellation part, then what is to be done? Okay, so this part of discussion, I guess, uh, we will be covering tomorrow. So for today, we are winding up. So today we have discussed regarding the GSTIN, then UIN. Uh, we have recapped the person who is liable for the registration. We have discussed with the person who is not liable for registration, the person who is liable for compulsory registration, the person who is liable for, I mean, his basically deemed registration. And now we have covered the procedure for your registration. Anyone is having any doubt?
so i assume your silence considering that you have understood okay then see you tomorrow till then take care bye